All right. So welcome everyone here in the room with me and on Zoom. Um, thank you to everyone who's here for braving the weather. We really appreciate you coming and joining us. Um, so tonight we will hear from Jana Gersovich about the upcoming solar eclipse and all the fun um, history and facts behind it, um, how to view it on Monday and all the other things. So my name is Susan Eastland and I'm on the programming team at Cary Library. Before we begin, I want to thank the Cary Library Foundation. Their support enables us to bring programs like tonight's to you. Um, if you have any questions, please um, ask Jana. If you're here in person, you can feel free to raise a hand um, in the middle of the presentation. If you're on Zoom, please submit them to the Q&A and we will answer them at the end. Um, this program is being recorded and it's going to be posted to the library's YouTube channel. So if you miss any of it, you can always go back and view it. And now I'd like to introduce our speaker. Jana Gersovich received her PhD in astronomy from Columbia University. Oops, skipping ahead here. Um, where she studied how small galaxies evolve over time. She worked as the Columbia Astronomy's Outreach Coordinator for many years and as a presenter at the American Museum of Natural History's Hayden Planetarium introducing the public to the cosmos under the bright skies of New York City. She co-authored the book Vacation Guide to the Solar System, Science for the Savvy Space Traveler, and resides with her family in Somerville, Massachusetts. So if everyone can please give a round of applause to our speaker. Thank you, Susan. Thanks for um, being here despite the weather. Um, I'm really excited to um, talk about the eclipse and eclipses in general. Um, so I'm going to start out and kind of tell you the whys and hows of eclipses. Um, and then we're going to move on to this specific upcoming eclipse on Monday um, and how you can view it safely. There's a lot of different ways. Um, and uh, we'll end with a little bit of cultural history related to eclipses. All right. so. Uh, oh, I forgot to tell you about this image. Um, I love this picture. This is a picture of a total solar eclipse um, as viewed from the International Space Station. So you can see the just the edge of the International Space Station there, and then there's this big dark spot on the Earth, kind of ominous looking. Um, and I love this image because uh, you know I'm going to show you some diagrams and some things with labels, but this is kind of the pure natural view of things from space. All right, so this is a model um, of where the sun and the, the moon and the earth will be located for Monday's eclipse. Um, and you can see the sun, the moon, and the earth in a line. And that's fundamentally all that um, a solar eclipse is, is a, an alignment of these three objects, the sun, moon, and earth, the moon between the sun and the earth, and the moon is casting a shadow. And you can see it's kind of got two regions of shadow. There's this really dark one, which is projecting a dark spot onto the earth. And it's moving, um, moving both you know, as the moon is orbiting around the earth and also the earth itself is turning. Um, and you'll also see there's a region of lesser shadow, which is outlined here in purple. Um, and that's uh, the area that will be viewing a partial solar eclipse. Um, so this we call the path of totality. This is where the dramatic, exciting event um, is going to be taking place. Um, and a slightly, it's still exciting, but slightly lesser <laughs> event where the partial solar eclipse is visible. And here um, you can see kind of the scale of the Earth and the Moon. Um, so. And play it again for us. Um, we are just very, very lucky to have total solar eclipses. There's nothing that says that the distances have to be aligned such that we get this event occurring. Um, it's, it's just by chance that the distance between the Earth and the Moon and the Moon and the Sun, that's 400 times larger than that distance between the Earth and the Moon. And also the size of the Moon versus the size of the Sun the sun is 400 times as large as the moon. Um, and so those, those things kind of cancel out such that when you look at it on the sky, it's um, about the same size. It's what we call angular size in astronomy. So it, it looks like it's the same size to us. 
Um, and it's a lot smaller than you might think. So if you look up and you're looking at the moon and you're looking at the sun um, and you reach out your arm, you might think, oh, maybe the moon is the size of my fist. No, no, it's like half the size of your pinky across. That's about half a degree. So it's pretty small if you actually measure it, although in our minds it appears much larger. Um, but both the sun and the moon have about that angular size, and that's why um, they can kind of um, uh, get in each other's way exactly. It's, it's really kind of a, um, a perfect coincidence. Did we have a question? Yeah, yeah. I want that just to clarify the, the sun being 400 times larger, is that the linear dimension? Of the sun? Uh, yeah, the, the, dis the, yeah, the distance across the diameter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah, good question. And then just so that you don't think that I'm fooling you with this picture, you can't really show this picture to scale. <laughs> um, so uh, otherwise, you wouldn't be able to see the moon or the earth or tell what's going on. And so just to give you a sense of, again, the sizes. This is the sun, the earth, and the moon. And you'll also notice there's some, some spots here on the surface of the sun. These are sunspots. Um, and, uh, and so those are actually visible. You should keep your, um, your eclipse glasses because if there are very large um, sunspots, you can actually view them later on with your eclipse glasses, which is kind of exciting. And um, all right. so. Some diagrams, I have to show you some diagrams just so you know what's going on. Um, but we're just gonna look at this um, situation that we have on the left here. So we have the sun, the moon, and the earth all lined up. So this flat area is just gonna represent our earth. Um, and I wanna talk to you about people standing right here, just in this little area marked A. Those are the people that are in the darkest part of the shadow. And the reason it's the darkest part of the shadow is because you get complete obscuration. The moon is gonna move all the way in front of the sun and you get the deepest part of the shadow. So what you're seeing from the ground in a, in a diagram sense is A right here. The moon is just a dark circle. Um, in front of the sun, um, but it's really spectacular. That doesn't do justice. Um, if you're in this area, that's the, the lighter gray right here. If you're standing on the side of that darkest part of the shadow, this is called the penumbra. And the reason it's a less dark shadow is just because only part of the sun is being obscured. And so what you would see if you were looking through your eclipse glasses is you would see a crescent sun. Part of the sun is being obscured, and it'll look different depending on how much of the sun is being is being covered at different times. Um, so we have both the situation where we have people in different areas that are seeing a total or a, um, a partial solar eclipse, um, and this also moves across the face of the Earth as that eclipse goes on. There's also a situation where you might think, you know, the moon is always at exactly the same distance away from the Earth, but that's not the case. Um, the, the moon's orbit around the Earth is an ellipse, and so sometimes it's further away, and that means that sometimes it's far enough away from us that um, its angular size gets smaller, and it can't actually block out the entire sun. And so that's the situation that we have on the right here, and we call this an annular eclipse um, from the Latin for ring. And this is what you would see. You would have to use um, eclipse glasses in order to, to view it, but you would just see a ring um, if you were completely aligned, if you were in the middle, this B area right here during an annular eclipse. So there was an annular eclipse um, just in October um, of 2023 that went across the United States, and you maybe didn't hear so much um, buzz about that one, even though it, it was passing through many, many states, just like this total solar eclipse will. All right. So um, I want to encourage you to view an eclipse from totality. It's just not the same to view a partial eclipse. It's an exciting event. It's very cool to view a partial eclipse. But um, if you're in the path of totality, if you're actually experiencing um, the, the complete total solar eclipse, it's a mind-blowing experience. Um, it's, so this is um, from XKCD. This is a, our, our chart here has coolness on the y-axis. And this is, this is where you're located, right? So everybody in this partial eclipse zone here, it's cool, it's all right, but um, it's not amazing. It's not mind-blowing. If you want that true experience, you do need to be in this very narrow path of totality. Um, then it becomes amazing. Anywhere in that path is going to be good. It's going to be different lengths of time depending on where you are, but 
it's, it's going to be quite an experience. So you might see numbers like, oh, well, in Boston, it's, you know, 93% covered, right? It's not 93% the experience of totality. You're still experiencing a partial eclipse. <laughs> um, uh, and so I was super lucky to have an experience in, in 2017. There was a total solar eclipse um, that crossed the United States. Um, I thought I wasn't going to be able to see it. I had just had surgery and I was trying to plan a trip, but I was like, I don't know if I'm going to be recovered enough. Um, so I had no plans and I was a week before the eclipse. I was very sad that I wasn't going to get an opportunity to see it. Um, but uh, every other astronomer had made plans and I had not. And there was a guy who had a private plane who wanted to go see the eclipse and I was available to go um, apparently plan this um, uh, eclipse experience. So, you know, with very little warning, I showed up at this um, airport. Um, luckily, I had my laptop with me because they said, where should we go to view this eclipse? And I said, oh my God. <laughs> so I got out my laptop and I, uh, I was uh, looking at the path of totality. We wanted somewhere that was within this path of totality. We wanted it maybe near the middle of the path of totality if we could, because that gives you a longer experience of, um, of, of darkness. Um, and uh, I also, most importantly, wanted the weather to be nice. We didn't want it to be overcast. Many places were overcast. This is the challenge of eclipse chasers is that um, like we might be seeing for Monday's eclipse, there are going to be large areas of um, very disappointed people if it's overcast um, where they're attempting to view um, the eclipse. So we, I looked at the weather um, and then I chose um, an airport and I said, well, why don't we land here? And they said, that's great, but the runway isn't long enough for a plane of this size to land. So we had to choose another one um, and we ended up in, uh, in northern Tennessee. <laughs> Um, so we landed at this airport and we had an, we had an incredible experience of totality and I'm going to talk to you about the, what that experience is like. And in fact, you might think, oh, wouldn't it be cool to view an eclipse from, from the plane? Yeah. And you can kind of, but you're not really getting the full experience because um, yeah, there's a lot of like <laughs> sensations and um, you feel this cool wind come in when, when totality comes your way. You see um, this sunset all around you. It's like, um, you know, it's like dawn, but instead of being in one direction, like it usually is where the sun's gonna come up, you see it in all directions because what you're seeing is the edge of this shadow. Um, so I, I really encourage them to, to land and experience it on the ground because it's a, it's a better experience. Um, all right, so. How fast does the shadow move? Uh, I don't know exactly, but I have a I have a video that will be that will show you um, timings. All right, so um, this is a rare rare event. Um, of course, that's why we're so excited about it. But why don't we get one every month? So the moon is going around the Earth once about every month, um, 29 and a half days, at least with reference to the, the Earth's sun line. Um, and so um, so you would think, oh, why isn't it getting in between? that often, and the case is that uh, there's actually a tilt, so I'm gonna start this video over. Um, the moon's orbit around the Earth is tilted compared to the Earth's orbit around the sun. So the Earth's orbit around the sun, we call that plane the ecliptic, and here you can see that shadow is falling below the Earth in this case, so you're not gonna get an eclipse. Um, it's offset, um, it's missing it. Um, and so it can miss it above and below. The situation has to be such that um, it's just in the right place um, of that tilt in order to get um, the solar eclipse. So that's part of what makes it rare. Um, and this is just another illustration of that. We call times when the tilt um, of that orbit is um, basically perpendicular to that sun-earth line. We call those periods see eclipse seasons. They happen um, I think it's like one every uh, 173 days. It's a roughly six months apart, but um, but those are eclipse seasons. Um, so yeah, so the rarity of these events, you you get a couple solar eclipses a year, but they might not be total solar eclipses. On average, you get a total solar eclipse somewhere in the world every 18 months or so. But again, it's just that narrow strip. So you can actually trace out where those paths of totality have, have fallen on the face of the Earth over time. And that's what this video is. And um, you can see this, this runs from 2000 BC to 3000 CE.
And you can see um, slowly with these narrow paths, it's filling in the surface of the Earth. Um, it's not completely uniform. There's some weird um, interaction effects with the Earth's orbit being elliptical and things like that that actually make solar eclipses slightly more common in the northern hemisphere. Um, but for the most part, if you're standing in any one area, on average, of course, it varies a lot, but on average, if you're standing in one spot, you get one every 300 some years. So very rare. And this is our um, Monday's eclipse. <laughs> um, and so the redmost line is totality, going right across the United States, hitting Mexico and Canada on either side. Um, and then the lighter areas are where you'll, you can experience the partial solar eclipse. That includes all of Massachusetts. I'll show a zoom in of that. And if you want to see the next one, you're going to have to wait until 2026. That's the next total solar eclipse. Um, that's going to occur, and you'll have to travel to northern Spain or Iceland or Greenland in order to see that one. Um, and so this is a series of photographs that were taken over the course of the whole eclipse. So this is over several hours um, and from somebody who is standing in the path of totality. And you can see that as the, the that shadow moves over in front of the sun, you're getting uh, more and more uh, cre the deeper and deeper crescent shape. Um, then you have totality, which lasts for a few minutes. And then on the other side, as it slowly moves off, you get the partial phases again. And this is a time lapse video of the same. And so you can see there are some sunspots for this particular eclipse. And so they're actually filming this um, through a solar filter, specially designed filter. These are the partial phases here, going into a deeper and deeper crescent. This is um, probably what we'd be seeing right now in Boston um, for the partial, and then it goes into totality. And this video, it, it's a cool video, but it doesn't, it's so much cooler in person, you guys. Um, it's, it's, yeah. Um, it's kind of hard to capture it because of like the the varying brightnesses. It's just it's not really uh, possible to capture it well, I think, in photography. And here they're getting some clouds, I think, as it goes out of the partial phases. All right. But um, uh, what's also cool is the way that it makes night into day when you experience totality. So. Um, here, you're going to see the sun slowly dim. Because it dims gradually, you almost don't notice it if you're in the partial phases. Here, we're in totality. And you can see the entire landscape has gone dark. It's, it's, it looks like it's night. You can, if you watch the horizon, you can see kind of, you can observe the edges of that shadow, right? You can see the dawn coming in all directions and then coming out of totality again. And what this video lacks um, is people screaming around you. <laughs> That's another really um, fun aspect of, of viewing this in person. Um, and so there are some features that you can actually observe um, during totality. So um, you saw there was kind of like a bright uh, a bright area as it's going, um, as totality is just coming in and going out. Um, that's called the diamond ring effect, because it looks like a diamond ring, it's a big bright spot. Um, and then you also get these things called Bailey's beads, which are like little bright areas as you're going around it. And that comes from the fact that the moon is not this perfect sphere. It actually has mountains and valleys, and you can imagine the sun's light streaming around and through those. Um, creating these um, irregularities along the edge. Um, and then uh, you may also see solar prominences. This is plasma from the sun, which is being shot out um, through um, magnetic field effects, basically. So these are loops of, of hot plasma um, going into the atmosphere. These are occurring all the time. We just can't you know, see them uh, unless the rest of the sun is blocked out. Um, similarly, you can see the corona, which is this um, uh, uh, a streaming hot, very, very hot kind of, you might think of it sort of as an atmosphere of the sun, um, and uh, also strongly affected by magnetic effects. Um, this is 
an enhanced image. Um, but I think it actually is more like what you experience when you're watching it um, by eye. Um, and you can see you can see loops in there, and you can see um, streaming streaming off of it. Uh, we had a question over here. Yes. Is the diamond ring effect and daily speed the same thing, just different scale? Uh, the question is, is is the diamond ring effect and Bailey's beads the same thing, just different scale? And I would say yes. Um, Bailey's beads kind of depends on the features. Um, and the diamond ring is, is only considered, it's like right where that area where it's last uncovered, for example, that's where that diamond would appear. But yeah, it's the same, same thing, more or less. All right, um, there's also some lesser known kind of weird effects. This was the thing that surprised me the most when I um, observed the total eclipse was um, it made, it, I can see why um, ancient peoples felt like it was a portent of doom because it makes you feel that way and I wasn't expecting that. I was expecting to be odd, but I wasn't expecting kind of the creepy character of the light um, because you just, you know, you're when you're in sunlight, you know, it's it's always seems the same. You're never noticing any difference, but there, there are some strange things that happen with shadows. Shadows become sharper. Um, just before totality. You also get something called shadow bands, and these are extremely hard to photograph, and they're not fully understood. Um, but here they have an enhanced um, image of them, um, and they're kind of these wiggly, warbly, dark and light bands. They appear to be moving very, very fast. Um, and what it is thought causes these is when you have just that little sliver of sun that's visible, um, it has to go through the upper atmosphere. And the upper atmosphere has these big convection currents and it refracts the light. It basically bounces the light around. Um, this is exactly what causes stars to twinkle in the night sky. Um, so planets are a little larger in the night sky and so that effect kind of gets averaged out. But when you have something that's really, really small and it has to go through the upper atmosphere, it bounces the light around, you get this twinkling. So it's kind of like sunlight twinkling um, in a sense. Um, and so those are the shadow bands. If you are um, going to totality and you want to observe these, I'd recommend getting like a big white sheet um, and kind of putting it on the ground or being, you know, by like a parking lot where you can kind of look at a large area that's of the same, um, same value so that you can try and observe these. All right, so our Monday's eclipse here, this is the path that it's going to take across the United States. And here's a zoom in. So um, it starts out, you know, in the ocean, but it's going to come in um, towards um, Mexico. And this will show you um, some of the major cities that it will cross. It also gives you timing. So you can see here um, we're starting out at um, about noon central time here. Um, the duration is how long it's going to last in the middle. So you can see if you're standing in the middle of the path of totality, you have to go through that whole circle. That's why you're experiencing a longer totality than if you're right at the edge, it would be short because you don't have very much shadow to go through. Um, so uh, San Antonio is just going to get grazed. Um, uh, Dallas is a, a major city that's um, in the path of totality. You don't want to be like one mile out of totality. That would be the most disappointing, I think. <laughs> I had a friend who posted on Facebook and uh, she was very close and I said, you have to get to totality. She later thanked me very much. Um, this area uh, in Illinois, Carbondale, actually saw the 2017 eclipse as well. So it crossed over in the other direction. So these people are super lucky. They get two <laughs> total solar eclipses. Indianapolis. And here we're going to come up on um, northern um, New York, the closest approach to um, Massachusetts. Like I said, none of Massachusetts is going to experience totality. It misses us entirely. You can see the shape is kind of elongating. That's because the Earth is round and it's kind of starting to go off the side of the Earth, basically. Um, and so the angle that the shadow is hitting is causing it to stretch out in that direction. And you can see that the duration of totality is, is going down at the center line as well. All right, so that went from about noon to about 4.30. Yeah, I was going to ask, would it be around 4, 4.30? Yeah, so the, our, our, yeah, so I'm going to talk about exact timings okay. for, for Boston area. Thank you.
All right, so this is um, a zoom in of um, the Northeast. Um, oops. And uh, so it's going to be uh, at its maximum um, extent at around 3.30 for us. Um, uh, and so these lines here are the percent of the sun that are going to be covered if you follow this down here. So we're between 90, and this line is actually 95, so maybe you know, 92, 93% covered, but again, not 92 or 93%, the fun of totality. Um, and this is for Boston, um, but this is from a website called timeanddate.com. You can go there, you can plug in wherever you're gonna be. It's very accurate um, in terms of timing. So the, the moon will first contact the sun um, at 2.16 in the afternoon, and then maximum extent is about 3.30, maximum eclipse, and uh, four, four, by 4.40, it will have moved off the face of the sun. All right, so let's talk about how to view this safely. Um, so during the partial eclipse phases, or through basically during the whole eclipse as it would be viewed for Massachusetts, you're gonna need special, um, uh, you're gonna need to do something to view it. Um, you're gonna need, um, you know, eclipse glasses. So we have these here are a common way of viewing it. But there's actually um, a lot of different ways um, to view this, um, which we'll talk about. During the totality, when it's night out around you, and it's very obvious when you're in the path of totality when that is, it's OK to look at it with your naked eye. It's not harmful. Um, but as soon as any of the bright surface of the sun, so really ideally before the diamond ring effect, you should be looking away. Um, and the reason for this is you, um, you can cause severe damage to your eyes. Your retinas do not have nerves in them. You have some protective reflexes for bright, but it's not gonna protect you in this case. If you are, if you are determined to stare at the sun, then you can um, sustain eye damage. It's not any more dangerous than if you were to stare at the sun on a non-eclipse day, um, but you wouldn't think to do that, I think. Um, but a lot of people think that there's something you know, particularly dangerous about eclipses. It's not that, it's that the sun is dangerous to eyes and you shouldn't be staring at it um, at any time. Um, ordinary sunglasses do not help you. In fact, they, they might kind of reduce those reflexes and allow you to do a lot more damage without realizing it. Um, you need to use um, eclipse glasses that meet a certain standard. ISO 12312-2 is the, the technical term for those, the standards. And um, these are generally, these are made out of mylar. Um, they're resistant to puncture. You should check whether they're punctured. You shouldn't be seeing anything through them unless you're really looking at something like the sun or something similar brightness to the sun. Um, uh, not safe. You should obviously never use binoculars or telescope to observe the sun. In any case, you're going to burn your eyes and you might start a fire too, even if, if you just happen to be um, have a telescope um, that's pointed in the general direction of the sun. I had a professor once that used to love taking a pencil out and like putting it at the focal point of the eyepiece and he would, he would you know, it'd smoke and burn and he was making the point. Do we have a question over here? Yeah. Can I say I'm ready to glasses Yeah, so these, so the, so the question is, can I wear my regular glasses and then put um, uh, appropriate um, eclipse glasses on top of it. They're designed to be flexible so that you can put them over your regular glasses. So that's what I would recommend. Um, and there are specially designed filters um, that are made for telescopes and binoculars. Um, uh, but again, it has to be designed for use with the sun. It should be very securely attached. When I use solar filters on my telescope, I always tape it on there. Um, and it should ideally be before any of the light of the sun gets in that object at all. Um, uh, definitely, you cannot use um, these glasses to like look through a telescope. It's just gonna burn a hole right through these. <laughs> Not gonna help you at all. Um, any questions about that? People are concerned about safety. So I see cameras and, and smartphones up there too. Like yeah. You can damage your you can damage your smartphone by pointing it at the sun. You know, it depends on um, depends on the smartphone. But what they do recommend is that you would cut the one of these out and put it over. They have a little picture here. Put it over the camera. It's going to be a different type of picture, though. But 
Yeah, and this is you know not a great way to use them because you could move it up or down, but it at least kind of gives you an idea of what to expect to see through the eclipse glasses, um, the crescent there. Um, but there's a lot of other techniques, even if you don't have eclipse glasses. Um, and in fact, you know, in history, um, uh, people were noticing that these eclipses were happening even when they didn't have special equipment or know that they were happening. Um, so on the left here, we have, it's just light through a tree. Um, and what's happening is the leaves are overlapping and they're making tiny little holes and those holes are acting as like pinhole projectors is what we call that. And they're creating images of the sun, many images of the sun on the ground. And so in this partial eclipse, you can see all of these crescents. It's really, um, it, it's really cool and very strange. Um, and so they were noticing that this was happening. Um, you can create the same effect yourself with your body if you just cross your fingers over and create these tiny holes between your fingers. Um, and, uh, and I should say, you're definitely not looking at the sun through these. You are letting the light from the sun travel through those holes, and then you're looking at the ground or whatever piece of paper, something that you're pro projecting onto, excuse me, <laughs> projecting onto, and you'll see images um, of the sun on the ground. Um, you can also use a, um, thank you. <laughs> You can also use a colander with the holes in the colander will also project images. Um, uh, and, and there's many tutorials of how to make like a box projector as well online. Um, uh, my favorite way of viewing <laughs> a uh, eclipse is using a disco ball. So each one of these mirrors is going to project an image of that partial eclipse onto the ground. So um, it's going to be a party. So. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about some uh, history related to eclipses really briefly. Um, uh, there was um, a famous experiment in 1919, um, which was um, uh, testing uh, Einstein's theory of relativity. So this is doing science with a solar eclipse. Um, and what they were looking at is um, they wanted to observe evidence of the curvature of space time. So Einstein's theory of relativity is that around a massive object, a massive object like the sun, for instance, that, that space is curved. And when light is traveling through that, it's going to change how it's going to, it's going to curve in its path. And what that does for us, if we're this observer over here, and we're looking out this lens, this is going to be the sun in this case. Um, any source, this would be stars. So for example, a cluster of stars that would normally be located behind the sun at this time, it would slightly change its position, slightly change its apparent position um, because that light was curved. And so when you project it back, this is where it looks. The blue spots are where it looks like it's coming from. Where it actually is, is here. Um, and so this was the prediction of um, Einstein's uh, uh, theory of general relativity. And it was what they wanted to test with the solar eclipse by looking at stars that were near the sun that you wouldn't normally be able to see. But when, of course, it's eclipsed, you have the opportunity to do so. So they, um, there were a couple astronomers that um, sent um, uh, expeditions, one to a West African island and the other to Brazil. And they were measuring the precise locations of these stars to see if it agreed um, with Einstein's uh, theory. And in fact, they found eventually that it did. There was a lot of discussion about it. There's actually, um, this, this story is, is fascinating and long. So, but, um, but this was the newspaper headlines, lights all askew in the heavens, men of science more or less agog over results of eclipse observations. Um, but of course, eclipses have been observed um, throughout history. So this is um, a Babylonian tablet, which uh, includes eclipse um, measurements, eclipse tables, um, and all of those complicated um, factors that went into predicting eclipses. So uh, it would, the, the um, fact that it has to happen at a certain time in the moon's orbit around the sun, the fact that the, um, you have to be in an eclipse season, um, and uh, also at a point where the, the moon's orbit around the sun is close enough. Um, all of these things had been picked up and, and measured by and recorded by Babylonian observations long ago. Um, and the way that they culturally interpreted that was, it was this very bad news for the king. <laughs> um, so this was considered to be a horrible omen and they had actually decoy kings and queens um, during these times. 
um, so that the, the gods would not destroy them um, that were later sacrificed. So, um, But also the Mayans were observing eclipses and trying to um, understand when they would occur. This is an image of um, a, a Mayan glyph which is representative of a, a female astronomer, um, is what um, scholars believe. And this is a picture of um, what's called the Dresden Codex. This is like a Mayan book. It's an accordion, bark-based book. And these are eclipse tables. So the Mayans found out the, um, the cycle of eclipse seasons. Um, and they, um, they, of course, weren't necessarily associating it with the tilt of the moon's orbit around the Earth, but they noticed the periodicity and they recorded that um, in writing. And so on the left here, this is um, a glyph for a lunar eclipse. You can kind of see the light and dark there. Um, and this is an eclipse for, or the glyph for a solar eclipse. You can see there's kind of this creature that's coming in. And, and that was how they described it in words, was there's some, something's taking a bite out of the sun, which is very, you know, if you look at those images, for example, on of the through the trees, it's very much how it appears. Um, and this is a Mayan woman today. So this was a program run through the Exploratorium Museum, um, which was um, bringing telescopes and microscopes, um, and also um, doing a knowledge exchange um, for the um, oral stories um, surrounding astronomy of the Mayan people. This language is still spoken today. And this on the left is a book that's written in Quiche Mayan um, about astronomy for children. So this, um, this uh, tradition is being, being kept up. Um, and this is um, from New South Wales. So there's um, a fascinating story related to um, the moon and how it goes through its cycles and why solar eclipses um, occur. And this is the ULA people um, in Australia. And um, so I want to read you a little bit. This is a, a short excerpt um, from a book called The First Astronomers, um, How Indigenous Elders Read the Stars by Dwayne Hamacher. Um, and I just love all of the observations that this narrative expresses. So when we talk about how the moon is going around in its orbit and how it's going above and below the ecliptic, how the, the tilt of the moon's orbit how the moon goes through phases, all of this is kind of put into a narrative form by, by these traditions. So in the ULA traditions of northern New South Wales, the sky is perceived as a dome that is held up by four wooden poles to which ropes made from the bark of the Kurajong tree are attached. It is the duty of certain spirit ancestors to hold the ropes that hold up the sky dome and keep it from falling. Long ago, Yi, the sun woman, had a series of lovers. One day she fell in love with Balu, the moon man, Balu did not reciprocate her feelings and rejected her advances. Yi grew increasingly angry that he wanted nothing to do with her. She pursued him and he put space between them, moving further away from her each day. In frustration, Yi commanded the spirits holding up the dome of the sky not to let Balu escape the celestial realm and come down to earth. If he did, she threatened to cast down the spirits and cause the sky to fall, plunging the land into everlasting darkness. The cycle repeats, but Baloo manages to escape most of the time. To avoid Yi and get to, the earth, get to the earth to carry out his duties, he is forced to sneak down past the spirits by disguising himself as an emu before dusk. But on rare occasions, Yi captures and tries to kill Baloo. She grabs him, but he manages to struggle free, helped by the spirits. When this happens, Yi goes completely dark. This is a solar eclipse. And I just love this story because there's so much astronomy, and yet it's so much of, of these people um, and their relationship to the universe. All right, thank you guys so much for coming. I'm happy to answer questions. And if you want to get in touch with me, uh, you can find me at janigers.com or summerstars.com. <laughs> Goes over Burlington and Montpelier, you have to be right there. Yeah, I'd recommend. So the question is, the totality does it go over Burlington or Montpelier? I don't know exactly where it is with reference, but you need to find a very accurate map. Um, the very edges of—I'm um, not sure if those are towards the center. If they're towards the center, then you're probably 
golden, but um, you do want to pay attention to where the exact edges of it are because, I mean, that can be affected by things like the moon isn't perfectly spherical, for example. So on the edges, whether you're going to experience totality or not can depend on, on the particulars. And what, yeah. what, what are we going to see here? Ah, yes. What are we going to see here? Yes. Um, we're going to see a partial solar eclipse. So if you're going about your day, you may not notice anything is different. It is going to get slightly darker around you. You might see the colors desaturate a little bit, um, but you probably would have had to have been told. <laughs> Unless you're an observant person and you noticed, for instance, through the trees, the, the pattern of crescents or things like that. Um, but again, if you have um, eclipse glasses, if you want to create your own pinhole projectors. There's a lot of different ways to actually observe it go through through those phases over the course of that whole afternoon and several hours. So will it be a crescent here? It will be a crescent here, but you will need to view it through eclipse glasses in order to notice. Mm -hmm. Yes? If you had an iPhone and you wanted to record the event and you had the special filter that you would put on the lens, would you recommend just taking different photographs or would you recommend doing a video of the whole thing to record it or you yeah that's a good question there's extensive conversations about how to how to best photograph these um, it is it can be very difficult because your phone is not accustomed to you putting something that's basically black in front of it so it can create a lot of problems with focusing and things like that um, but people have worked out the specifics i'm not an expert on how to photograph it um, but uh, but yeah, it, the event itself will occur over hours, so you might want to think about it in that sense. It might be better to take pictures if you don't want to have your phone tied up for that amount of time. Um, so we had a question from Zoom. Yeah. Um, with the shadow bands that you mentioned earlier, is it possible to see those if people are up north and there's snow on the ground? Oh, I think if you, yeah, if you're in, again, this is only really occurring just before, just after totality, so you do have to be in that region, but if there's snow on the ground, I would imagine it would be a perfect environment in which to observe shadow bands. So you said that um, it will, here, it'll begin around 2.15 and maximum eclipse is at around 3.30. Mm -hmm. What is a good time to, if you can't be out that whole time, when, when's the... Yeah, come out, come out for maximum. Yeah. It's so like 15 minutes beforehand? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. it's, it's going to be gradual and it's not going to change rapidly. It's going to be a smooth transition from when that comes across and when it reaches maximum and then when it goes out. So if you, you know, if you miss it by 10 minutes, you wouldn't even notice a difference. It's, you don't have to be so precise about the timing. So I understand that during the totality, you can actually watch the eclipse without glasses on. Uh, so uh, are there any issues about like judging when you need to take them on and off? Yeah, if you're in an area with people, people generally count down. Um, that's helpful. Um, if you want to be safe, you, you're safe when it looks like night around you. <laughs> um, the damage, it takes like a couple seconds for damage. So as soon as you really see any brightness come out, you should look away and you should be fine. Um, but but chances are if you're in a, in a crowd, people are going to be counting down. So you'll have a very good idea of what's, what's happening. Thank you. I'm going to come up to the front, but someone from Zoom asked, where are you going to be watching? <laughs> That's a great question. So I, um, I have a six month old and I was trying to plan for to, to go somewhere for totality. In this case, I was trying to go to Dallas and I was just like, this is just too logistically hard. And I was very disappointed. And this morning I was very disappointed because I was like, I'm going to talk about eclipses and I'm not going to actually see totality. I'm going to talk about how cool it is, right? And then um, I have a lot of astronomer friends. One of them said, you know what, I have a backup plan. It looks like it's going to be cloudy in Dallas. And my backup plan was to go to this um, Airbnb in Montreal, which is, you know, a four hour drive on a non eclipse day. Um, and I thought, you know, why don't I just pack up my six month old and try and do this? So that's where I will be. I will be in Montreal doing a crazy last minute trip, um, just like last time. <laughs> we also will be in Montreal. Oh, so wonderful. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I just wanted to ask, but I like when we were checking the totality part did not go through Montreal. I think I believe we need to come down south. Yes, right. Yeah. So I, have you figured that out? Absolutely. Yeah. We look. We looked at the uh, charts, and it's actually in totality. Just like uh, 
which town or where we could see the totality? Uh, yeah, I would recommend going to the interactive maps where you can zoom in. So NASA has a fantastic interactive map or timeanddate.com and putting in the precise location where you're going to be located. They have um, very accurate estimates um, where you can just look at the map and, and act or actually just be told, you know, so here you can, well, that one doesn't really have it on it, but, um, but yeah, I would recommend going to an interactive map, zooming in on your actual location. If you have GPS coordinates, even better. Um, and, and, cause you don't want to miss it. And if you're at the edge and you're not sure, I would drive towards the center line just to be safe. You don't want to miss totality and be that close. That would be just a tragic event. <laughs> Uh, and another suggestion I have is I'm a retina specialist and I have seen multiple of the sunburns so I would not suggest anybody taking off their glasses because it happens in span of many seconds. Yeah, uh, yeah. So uh, if you feel you want to take off glasses, look down. Mm -hmm. But while you are uh, looking up, please don't do that because I have seen multiple cases of people getting affected. Yes, yeah, you're hearing it. <laughs> I, I noticed that, that you, earlier in the presentation you said um, you showed some, some views from the space station. Mm -hmm. Could you elaborate on what they what they what they are actually seeing or could see? Yeah, I think from the space station it just looked like a dark spot moving across the Earth. <laughs> um, and yeah, and I don't know. I mean, if you think about the the course of that um like if i go back to this you know we're starting we're starting here at noon it's starting in mexico and uh, and well, i guess they're orbiting faster if they're on the space station <laughs> so i guess it would go out of sight and then come back um but it would look like a black stain upon the earth is what it would look like to them so there's there's no chance that they could be like uh, oh, like looking back at the yeah. sun. So I think what they would view, that, so um, I don't know that you would, you'd, it'd have to be a very, very brief, perfect alignment um, for the, the space station to actually, in its orbit, be located in the Umbra. I imagine it could happen, um, but would be very, very rare. Um, but, uh, but presumably they're orbiting through the penumbra, so if they were to look back at the sun, they would see a partial eclipse. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Here, let me just close out the Zoom. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so thank you so much, everyone who was here in person and who um, tuned in on Zoom. Um, again, this has been recorded, so we're going to put it up on YouTube. I'm going to try to get it up tonight so that everyone can rewatch it or to anyone who missed it. Um, I'm handing out Eclipse glasses now. We're going to have a good amount left over, so for anyone at home, um come on into the library tomorrow they're going to be at the main desk um the circulation desk on the main level and the children's desk um thank you again for tuning in and have a good night and thank you to jana for um, hosting this amazing informative program thank you so much. Thank you.